Sabbath peace. Another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are watching in on the camera, to, to, to the saints scattered around the world that we don't know about, to the saints that are in the chat, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Um... So last week, what did we talk about? <clears throat> um, last week what was we in Luke. We was in Luke uh, fourteen. So we talked a lot about the parable of of Yahushua saying, you know, what I'm saying that many people were invited to the feast, but they all had excuses. And we look back at Deuteronomy, we saw those were the exact same excuses that a person could have for going to the war, and our our our, our commanders were supposed to tell us and say, hey, look. If you got these issues, you're not worthy to go to war. Go ahead, go take your butt back home. And so Yahushua is giving the same message saying, look, if you get invited to the wedding feast and you got excuses, then you're not worthy to come to the wedding feast. Go on, go on back home, go do what you do. But you're going to be on the outside, right? You're going to be on the outside looking in. And so he ended up sending the invitations to many other people. And we talked about being prepared, right? Our preparedness, right? If you, if you, if you, if this walk is not for everybody, Right. And so it would it would be behoove us to acknowledge that that not everybody is going to want to do it. Right. And when we say it's not for everybody, it's not that we can look at a person and we can say, oh, no, it ain't for him. All right. That's not our position. We don't have the insight to be able to do anything like that. But at the end of the day, some people are going to choose that this is not for them. So at an individual level, right within yourself, you got to ask yourself, is this for me? Is this something I even want? Is this something I want to desire? And if it is then you got to make sure you you're prepared to take on this walk because it's going to come with a lot of challenge, right? It's going to come with a lot of challenge. Um, and, and if you prepare for that, then you can go forward. But he gave us a par parable. He said, you know what I'm saying? What man going to build a tower and find out halfway through building it that he don't have all the materials to build it. Right. And that's what we want to try to avoid. We want to make sure that we've considered the things we've learned, what we need to learn and we make an informed decision. Right. We look and we take stock, we take inventory of everything that we got in us, everything that we need to get, and then we move forward based off of what we have and what we expect. Um, this week, though, let's let's jump into uh, John chapter 11. <clears throat> this is John chapter 11. Give me verse one. This is John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. All right, so you that. remember last week we talked a little bit about, um, or maybe it was the week before last, maybe it was the week before last. Week before last, we talked a little bit about when Yahushua showed up to Mary and Martha's house. You remember Martha was doing all the work and serving everybody and fixing the plates and doing all that good stuff, but Mary was sitting down and she was hearing the word. So this is that same Mary and Martha. They had a brother and their brother's name was was Lazarus. All right. So Lazarus is is uh, is uh, we about to learn that Lazarus is about to die. Right. And so Yahushua is about to respond to that. Let's read. Keep going. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped her wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, so we haven't read that part yet, but we going to uh, probably in, a, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to read how Mary uh, pours oil on Yahushua's feet and wipes her wipe, wipes his feet with her hair. Right. So that part hasn't happened yet. But for that's a so what it seems like, it, that's a very popular story amongst the disciples. So when when John is writing this down, he's identifying her for that event, because that's it seems like that's an event that everybody knows about. But in the actual chrono chronology of when it happens, it hasn't happened yet in the story. 
So I just want to point that out. So we'll we'll get to that and then we'll kind of reference back to this so it's not so confused. Keep going. Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Which Yahshua heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Yahshua loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Right. So Yahshua loved all three of them. Right. So he had a really, really, really good relationship. Just, I mean, a, a physical relationship in the sense that like not a spiritual like, oh, God loves his children type of situation. Like as a man, as a son of Adam, as a human being, he loved these three people. Right. It's like this, these are my people. Like I'm, I rock with them. They rock with me. I rock with them. So all of them are strong believers. All of them have strong faith. And you about to see it. Watch this. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then right. So now Yahushua heard that that he was sick. Yahushua had been healing the sick this whole time. This his man's right. His man is dead. And everybody know that's why they came up to him like, yo, Lazarus, the one you love. Oh, he's sick. They looking like that's your man. He's sick. So he's been healing the randoms. It's a couple of Gentiles that Yahushua healed, right? A couple of people that's not even of our people that he healed, laid hands on, and now they was they wasn't sick no more, right? He resurrected. It's some people that that they was like, oh, they died. He walked in right after they died and brought them back to life. Now you got your man, right? Your man. He about to die. Yahushua like, ah, we got another two days, right? He didn't rush to go get to him. But remember what Yahushua just said. He said, listen, he's not sick unto death. This is happening for the glory of Yahuwah, right? The glory of the son of man, right? Watch this. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, said he, to his, said he to his disciples, let us go into Judah again. And his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou there again? Right. Yeah. So look, the disciples are looking at him like, are you crazy? We just left. Right. We just got done reading how the boy picked up. He said he came. He came to him. I was like, man, before Abraham was, I am. They looked at him like, what? He said, look, I and the father are one. They looked at him like, what? So all these times they picking up the stones. They ready to kill this boy. Right. Y'all sure have to get out of Dodge. You got to slip the stones. He got to get away and all that. So now. He talking about going back to Judah, back to Jerusalem. And they looking like, man, you do know that these boys, as soon as they catch you, they're going to kill you. Right? Like they're going to kill you. What are you doing? You really want to go back? Let's keep going. Watch this. And Yahshua answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that, he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then right. So he said, look, our friend Lazarus, Lazarus, he sleepeth. Right. But he said, don't worry about it because I got to wake him up. So now we, some of us are familiar with this story. So we know he's talking about bringing Re Lazarus back to death. I mean, back to life from death, right? But the people, when they hear, when they say he's sleeping, look how they look at it, right? They don't look at it as like, oh, he about to come back. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all sure about to resurrect the man. They look at it a little different. They look at it like, uh-oh, you know what I'm saying? That, that's, that's a, that's, they don't look at it like it's good news. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he just sleep. He's sick. He's getting some rest. Watch this. Keep going. Then said he, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Albeit Yahushua spake of death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said right? So them, they, they were thinking like, listen, he needs, look, he's sick. Yahushua pop up and be like, man, Lazarus is, you know, sleeping. I'm going to go back and wake him up. They look at him like, oh, well, good. Last we heard of him that the man was sick. You know what I'm saying? Sick and about to die. So, you know, he probably need the rest. You know what I'm saying? It's good. He's probably going to do his body some good to get the rest. But Yahushua talking about death. Right? Watch him. Watch what he, he clarified for. Then say Yahushua unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> right? So he look, he look like, look, you, look, all right, I'm trying to speak in a parable. But, you know, he always explained his parables to, to the disciples. So when he saw that they didn't understand it, 
it's not like he's talking to these Christians, right? He's not talking to the great multitudes. He's talking to the disciples. So it's like, no, let me say it plainly to you. So Lazarus is dead is what I'm saying. Like he's dead. He's not alive. You know what I'm saying? The man is dead, right? But that's the clarity. Our people, though, when we know our scripture, this is not confusing language, right? If we if we are familiar, this is something that's used throughout scripture, right? Grab Deuteronomy chapter 31. But remember, Moses, Moses was told you cannot go into the promised land. Y'all told Moses that he gave him. He already get it like he didn't surprise Moses. It didn't catch him off guard. Remember, Moses kept asking about it. Moses, I God told him at some point, look, let me tell you something. You're not going and don't ask me about this no more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Moses, I God told him, look, and don't ask me about it no more. Kind of like our mama when we like, I want to go to the store. All right, don't ask for nothing at the store. Right? And then you go to the store and you get something. It's like, ooh. And you know you're not supposed to ask. But it's like, maybe, just maybe. You know what I'm saying? She in a good mood. She's sitting there. My mama never talked to darn strangers. She said I had a whole conversation with some white lady. I'm looking like, oh, no, she definitely would give me the candy today. You know what I'm saying? They used to have like little store we used to go to. They used to have a Lucas powder. I used to like the Lucas. Yeah, Lucas powder. Oh, man. Especially if they ever had like the little green one. So I grab it. My mom. You know what I'm saying? And you never really ask outright because you know she told you not to ask. So you just kind of like Show it to her while she's talking, like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And then she turn around, stop her whole conversation, whole mood change. Boy, didn't I tell you? Don't ask me for nothing. To put that back. Then you see you got to walk around with the moat face for the rest of the day. Dang it. You know what I'm saying? That's how Moses felt. Moses was like, man, so you know what you think about me? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Don't you ask me that no more. Right? Go and get your butt up. This is what he told him. Watch this. This is, uh, this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, 31. Give me verse 14. It's Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 14. Watch the book say. Yahuwah said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Yahushua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. Moses and Yahushua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And Yahuwah appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud. And the pillar of cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord and Yahuwah said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And this people thou shalt what? Sleep with thy fathers. So look, that's what he told Moses. This is what Yahuwah told Moses back when Yahushua, the son of Nun, right? Joshua, the son of Nun, back when he was taken over and he was going to take the people to the promised land, right? So now Moses looking like, I can't go to the promised land. Joshua, or Yahushua, the son of Nun, he is going to the promised land. And now you got Moses in there. He got to die. And so the description of it is you are going to sleep with your fathers right so y'all always use this language of sleep with us right he said the same thing grab um grab second kings he said the same thing i mean uh first king first king chapter two is what i meant grab first king chapter two he said the same thing to david right start me off what i want is later but start me off at the first at the first uh chapter i mean first verse this is uh first kings chapter two verse one Right. Because remember, David was trying to David had at the end of his life, he had a lot of prosperity. He had a lot of peace. Right. He, he had taken over Ammon and Edom and Syria and all these different places of uh, the Philistines and all that. He taken over all their territory and he had them subject to him. They were all paying him tribute. So David kind of started like a, a small empire. And so he had everything set up. He had all the materials needed to build the temple. He had everything set up for his son, Solomon, right? So when he was about to die, he wanted to give Solomon his instructions on his deathbed. Like, look, this happened, this happened, this happened. Make sure you take care of business. Most of it was about the people that had wronged David and needed judgment that David didn't judge during his lifetime. You know, David had a lot of guilt, a lot of stuff that David blamed himself for a lot of stuff that happened to Israel, right? So he it's a lot of people that he didn't judge. He had mercy during his life. But he said, look, Solomon, don't you let these people die. You know what I'm saying? Without giving them just due. Right. So he gave them, you know what I'm saying? Some instructions. Started off at uh, verse one. This is a uh, first Kings chapter two, verse one. On the days of David, drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon. That he should what? That he should die. Right. So this is David about to die. Watch this. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. 
and keep the charge of Yahuwah thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Mm -hmm. That Yahuwah may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, then shall not fail thee, there shall not fail thee a man. There shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, thou knowest all what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did unto me, and what he did unto the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew. Right, so he, jump on down, give me verse 10. So he goes through all the instructions of like, hey, this is what you need to do to, to Joab, this is what you need to do to Shimei, all these different people that, you know what I'm saying, that, that require judgment, right? So this is uh verse 10, but watch what watch what's said at the end. So David slept with his fathers and was buried. David did what David. now? David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. So in his death, it was described as him sleeping with his fathers. So jump on back to 11, to John 11, right? So that's how it was described throughout the scripture. There's many, there's many, there's many instances where it's described as sleeping with our fathers, right? So this is if anyone really, really, really paid attention to scripture when he said that and he explained it as death, it wouldn't have been anything shocking. Right. His disciple would have been like, you're right. You're right. That is what the scriptures say. They may not have caught it. Obviously, they didn't catch it right away. Right. But after he said this is death, it wouldn't be like, why are you describing death as sleep? That would have been something that they catch on to. Like, you know what? Yahuwah did the same thing. Right. This is scriptural for us. It's important that we tie these concepts back to scripture, because remember, like we talked about in the in the uh, the uh, Feast of Tabernacle study. Right. It's it's about believing on Yahushua as the scripture has said. Right. Uh, this is uh, John chapter 11. What verse? 14. This is John chapter 11, verse 14. Watch the book. Say. Then Yahushua said unto them plainly. Yeah, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Yahushua came, he found that he had lying in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem about fifteen furlong off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And right. Martha, so Martha and Mary, they, they mourning because their brother had been dead for four days, the book says. Right. So then many of the so Bethany is close to Jerusalem. Right. And it's getting close to the time of Passover. But even if it wasn't, it's close to Jerusalem. So it's many people from Jerusalem that came up. The people of Judah, the people that live in the in the, in the area of Judah, they came up and they, they came in to comfort them because it's like. You know what I'm saying? We all know Lazarus. That's a good dude. You know what I'm saying? So they come and they comfort them, making everybody feel good. Think of it kind of like a funeral, right? So they doing that, right? And Yahushua is approaching. Watch what happens. And Martha, as soon as she heard that Yahushua was coming, went and met him. And Mary sat still in the house. And Martha said unto Yahushua, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Right? So Martha that. came to him and she was looking like, you know what I'm saying? They came to her church and was like, oh, Yahushua on the way. And she's like, how far is he? Now he right up the way. He's coming up. So what she did is she didn't wait for him to come. She ran out to meet him. You know what I'm saying? Who's that remind us of? We don't have to get it. But who does that? that don't that remind us of uh, 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 the woman, the woman uh, who set aside the house for Elisha? Right. Remember when 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 Elisha was coming, I mean, when she was going to Elisha, you remember the the, the servant had to go out and meet her on the way. Right. And then meeting her on the way, he was like, you know what I'm saying? She was like, oh, no, I'm fine. It's good. And then she ran and she only wanted to talk to, you know what I'm saying, Alicia himself. She didn't want to, she didn't want to talk to nobody else, just Alicia. You know what I'm saying? So it's similar in, in that, you know what I'm saying? She went out there to meet Yahushua because she only wanted to talk to Yahushua. Right? Watch this. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give it thee. And Yahushua said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, yeah, see how she knows the scripture. Right. It's important to know that these people that were around Yahushua 
We're not just sitting here getting dumber around him. He is teaching them scripture. He is teaching them to make sure they understand how this thing works out. Look at her response. He says, I will, your brother is going to raise up again. And she's like, oh, I know. He's going to raise up when? Read, read it again. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. At the last day. She's not talking about, in her expectation, there's nothing in her mind to say, y'all, she's about to walk over to his gravesite and tell him to come walk out of there. She don't even have that. That's not even in her imagination because she's never been taught that. She's never seen that. Yahushua has resurrected a couple people so far that we've read, right? Every time they just died. Like people wasn't even, when after they brought them back, people wasn't really even sure that they died. They just died. This man had been dead four days. Four days and they know it. They ain't think about him being resurrected. They look like, no, I can't nobody do nothing like that. It's crazy. We've never seen that. We've never seen nobody done, dead for four days be resurrected. That's not documented anywhere in our scripture. Right? So it's like, what we got to do is we got to look at it and be like, these people knew the scripture because her mindset was, oh yeah, he's definitely going to be resurrected in the last days. Right? Watch this. Yahshua said, unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Right? So he asked her, he said, do you believe? I am the resurrection and the life. Anybody who believe on me, even if he dead, he'll be resurrected. And if you are alive and you believe on me, you will never die. Do you believe this? Right? And so in her mind, Yes. Right. She she just told you, like, don't you just don't. I, I know that he's going to be resurrected in the last days. She knows the scripture already. Right. There's no doubt in her mind about that piece. She's just saying, man, look, had you been here. Four days sooner. My man's will still be alive. You know what I'm saying? Watch what she say after that. Do you believe these things? She said unto him, yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God which shall come into the world. And when she had when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, the master has come, calleth for thee. Right? So she, she made it clear to him, I believe, and I know you the Messiah, and I know you the son of God. She believes on him according to what the scriptures say. There's no doubt about that. He's very familiar. Go to, uh, y'all remember Job? Go to Job. This is Job, uh, Job 30, uh, 30, Job 19, Job 19, verse 25. This is Job chapter 19, verse 25. Right? She's making it clear to him that I understand the scripture. I'm with you. You don't have no doubts with me. And it's good because we can see that she did. She knew about the resurrection at the end. That's because Yahushua has been teaching her. Right? She's very well versed. You can see it. He asked her, do you believe anything? He's like, yeah, I believe you the Messiah and I believe you the son of God. Remember before that, the only person we heard that confessed that was uh, Peter. And Peter is walking around with her all the time. W walking around with Yahushua all the time. You can see that she's not. Yahushua had to pop up in town to meet her. And then again, he, uh, you know what I'm saying? He popping up in town to meet her again. So it's like she's not like constantly with Yahushua. It, it doesn't appear at least. Right. But still, she understands she's very close to Jerusalem. She probably gets more exposure to the scriptures, maybe. Who knows? Nevertheless, she understands. Right. She knows what she's getting at. This is uh, Job chapter 19, verse 25. Watch this. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Though after my skin worms destroyed. At the what the day? At the latter day upon the earth. So it's not difficult for her to believe this. I know my Redeemer is going to stand at the latter day upon the earth. What's going to happen? And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me, but ye should say, 
why persecute we him setting the root of the matter is found in me right so he's describing that the worms eat his butt up but nevertheless somehow he gonna see god with his own eyes so in other words he's going to be resurrected right that's scripture she no, she know job y'all should have to teach her about job right what about daniel this is daniel chapter 12 daniel chapter 12 give me verse 1 Job said, in the latter day, you know what I'm saying? I already know I'm going to see you again. Even if the worms eat up my body when I'm dead, I know I'm going to somehow see you again. He's talking about the resurrection. Right? This is Daniel uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Watch how clearly Daniel say. And at that time, shall Michael stand up? The great prince. He said, at that time. At what time? Okay, go, go to chapter 11, because this is a continuation from chapter 11. Go to chapter 11. Give me verse 40. So we got to figure time, out what that time is. Watch this. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall right. So now over. Daniel is telling us at that time at the end. Right. So he's giving us the time that he's talking about. Keep going. Watch. He's describing what's going to happen at the end. And he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but mm -hmm. he shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he, he said, who not going to escape? The land of Egypt shall not escape. Look, so watch how the land, the land of Egypt can't escape. Ain't no getting around it for the land of Egypt. You know what I'm saying? But watch what happens next. But he shall live power. She, he shall have power over the treasuries of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go with a great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. And he uh -huh. shall the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Nobody is going to help him when he comes to the end. We're going to talk about all this when we when we talk a little bit more about prophecy. Um, but let's keep going. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at right. That so time, this is at that time. This is the end. Remember, verse 40 in chapter 11 told us at that time in the end. And so he's telling us at that time, this is still the end. Then there's going to be great trouble. Something like it ain't never been before. But watch this. Uh, even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book and many of them shall sleep in the dust of the earth and shall awake they're gonna do what the sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt and they that be wise shall shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever mm -hmm. so now that's also talking about the resurrection so this is something that he's familiar with, right? That all the people are familiar with. And that now, of course, Martha is familiar with because she walks around. And she's being taught by the Messiah. So when he asked her the question, we can go back to chapter 11 in, in John. Right. So when he asked her the question, he's asking her, he's saying, listen. Your brother is going to rise again. Right. And she's like, man, I know. I understand that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, in the in the, in the last days. You know, in the resurrection, he's going he gonna to rise again. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Then he asked her, he was like, man, I am the resurrection and I'm the life. She still don't know what he's saying, right? I am the resurrection. I don't know life. Anybody who believe on me is going to rise again. Anybody who believe on me that's still alive ain't going to die. Right? He asked her, do you believe anything? She's like, yes. And I believe you the Messiah and I believe you the son of God. Then after that, she's looking like, ain't no reason for me to deal with this conversation any further. Let me go tell Mary you here. So then she ran to Mary and she was looking like, yo, the master's here. Right. Watch this. Keep going. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now, Yahshua was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha had met him. And the Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying she goeth unto the grave to weep there. Mm -hmm. Then when Mary was come, when, when Mary was come where Yahshua was, 
and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And when Yahushua therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And See, now, so, Yahushua groaned in his spirit and was troubled. I like this, right? Because it gives me a different level of insight. You have, so you have, to, you have to take Yahushua who knows the whole play. He already knows what the play is. When they told us he was about to die, Yahushua was like, okay, it's cool. Let's spend two more days out here. But he wasn't rushing to get back. He told them very clearly, this is done for the glory of the Son of Man. Right? He knows that he's about to, the glory of Yahuwah is about to be shown through, through, through Lazarus dying. Right. So he explained that to the people. Then after that, they told him like, oh, OK, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Do you really want to go back to Jerusalem? He's like, yeah, I want to go. He sleep. They look like he sleep. He's like, well, all right, man, he dead. Right. But at no point did we get like an emotion from him. Then he gets around them and he's troubled internally. All these people is crying. Mary come up to him. Like, you have to see what moved Yahushua. This is the son of the living God, right? He, this woman ran up to him crying, right? Mary, I mean, Martha didn't come up to him the same way. She said something similar, but Martha was like, her faith wasn't, wasn't shaken at all, right? Martha kind of came up to him and was like, oh, man, if you was only here early, my brother would still be alive. But it's all right. I know he's going to raise up in the last day, Right? Mary was a little different. Mary was upset. Right? Seemed like Mary didn't even want to go, go run out and meet him. You know what I'm saying? Mary was a little bit upset. She come to him like, why weren't you here sooner? He would still be alive if you was here sooner. And all of a sudden, Yahushua was troubled. Right? You can see that this is the humanity of him. Right? He's susceptible to the same temptations we have. He already knows the play. He knows that y'all that y'all is about to raise this man up. He knows it already. But it doesn't stop him from being moved emotionally, from having compassion on how everybody feel and how, how much everybody loved this man. Right? Watch him. Keep going. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Yahushua wept. Then said the Jews, behold. Yahushua did what? Wept. He cried. So Yahushua, knowing that this man is about to be resurrected, at his mouth, Yahushua still cries about this situation. Right? Because he really loved dude. But knowing that... His man is not gone. His man is going to be resurrected. He still cried about it. This is different, right? It's different from what we've seen so far from Yahushua. Yahushua has been so focused, he shows little emotion about anything, really. There's only a couple things so far we've seen emotion from when he talked about, oh, I wish that y'all would pay darn attention. Do you know how many times I wish I could gather y'all? That was emotion that we saw from Yahushua. We saw emotion when he was angry, right? He flipping over the table and all that. We saw emotion from him, but there's not a, a most of the situations. He's sitting there and he calm, cool, collected, right? These people try to get him riled up and they, he's not getting riled up. But on a man that he knows is going to be resurrected, he starts crying. <laughs> he's troubled internally, right? Watch what happens next. Then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused this, even this man should not have died? Right? So they looking at it. It's like a split. Some of them looking at it like, ain't this the dude that, this y'all man's, right? That's all y'all tell us is that this dude be doing all these miracles and that a blind man was blind. You know what I'm saying? Like, why couldn't he have stopped? You trying to tell me all the power that he got. Him being, y'all call him the Messiah. You mean to tell me that he couldn't stop his own friend from dying? They looking at him like, what type of Messiah is that? You know what I'm saying? Like, what type of power is that? Right? Yahushua trouble crying the whole time. Watch this. Yahushua, therefore, again, groaning in himself, coming to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Yahushua said, take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, 
by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. And Yahshua said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where he was dead, where the dead was laid. Yahshua right? So they looking God. like, listen, it's been four days already. You telling us to take away the stone where he is. Don't you realize that by this time, the man stinks like his body has already start to decompose and it's going to create a smell. That's why we sealed him away so that nobody have to deal with that smell. Right. But he looked back. He was like, man, didn't I just tell you that if you believe you're going to see the glory of the most high God? All right, then just move the darn stone. But then they moved the stone. Right. And then watch what he did. And he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always because but because of the people which stand by i said it and that they may believe that thou hast sent me and when he thus had spoken he cried with a loud voice lazarus come forth and he said and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with graving clothes with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin and yahshua said unto them loose him and let him go right so he he rose up and he all tied up Right? You know what I'm saying? All wrapped up and everything. And after that, he told him, go ahead and cut him loose. So the man was a lie. They looking like, they looking like, oh man, we lost our, our brother, this, that, and the other. He opened the thing up. They thinking that he gonna be stinking. He told him to come out. Lazarus come right on out. And he, you know what I'm saying? I like to imagine he like kind of hopped out like this. You know what I'm saying? He probably, mouth probably wrapped up and everything. And he like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know what I'm saying? Y'all, she was like, no, nah, man, cut him loose. It's good. But remember, y'all, she was sitting there crying too. Right? So it just shows that, like, like he's susceptible to the same emotions that we're moved by. That's important to me because it's I like the man was human, right? It's like y'all sure that we're looking at was human. It's not, it's not, it means that some things that we think are impossible are not impossible. Right? That means that every single situation that we would look at with Yahushua, that we would be like, man, that would have made me mad. Or I wouldn't have had that much patience. Or I wouldn't have done this. Or I wouldn't have been out all those situations. You could. It's possible. Because you see that it's not like the man is without emotion. Because he's been moved a couple times with emotion. Even in the situation where he knows everything was going to be all right. He knew it was going to work out. And still it moved him emotionally because he loved this guy. And he loved the people that loved this guy. Right? So then he started crying over it and then the man get up. It's important to understand that we are not the emotions that be threatening to take, take over us. Right? We're bigger than the emotion. The emotion can't stop the action. The, the emotion can't stop what we came here to do, what the Most High God sent us to do. Otherwise, you get so sad that maybe, maybe you won't be able to do the miracle that the Most High God got in front of you. Right? If Yahushua got so lost in the fact that he was dead, his, his friend was dead, maybe y'all, maybe y'all can't use him to show the glory of the Most High God. Right? If Yahushua in so many of these other situations where the Pharisee is tempting him, if he gets mad and angry and reacts out of anger. Maybe it don't have the same testimony. But the fact that he knows when to release his emotions and when to when to tuck them things in and do what he needs to do, that's inspiring. Right? That's something that he's showing us. Right? It's not about being completely emotionless. It's just about knowing when and how to use your emotions and making sure your emotions don't use you. Right? Keep going. And many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things which Yahushua did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Yahushua had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man right, so listen, miracles. After they saw this, you have to understand like he, Yahushua keeps up in the ante. You know what I'm saying? Like he starts off and it's like, oh, this person got a little cough. You know what I'm saying? Then all of a sudden, People can't walk and now they're able to walk. Right? Then he started resurrecting people. People been blind their whole life. He calls them to see. 
But now you take a person that was confirmed dead, had been dead for day, four whole days, this man been dead. And then he was resurrected and he was resurrected in front of many of the people of Judah in Jerusalem. So then after that, those people was like, OK, all bets are off. We got to go talk to the Pharisees. We have to. But the Pharisees is telling us this man got to die. I spent a weekend with him. And I saw him resurrect somebody that I was mourning. I wasn't even about to snitch him out just because it's like I know this is man. It'd be wrong of me to go tell the Pharisees he right here. You know what I'm saying? When he mourning our homeboy. You know what I'm saying? It's like our mutual homeboy. I don't mess with him like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm kind of skeptical of him. Pharisees been telling me that he's not the one. All these people believe he is the one. I could have snitched him out. However, I just watched this guy resurrect the guy that's been dead for four. Listen, I got to go talk to the Pharisees. So a group of, of, of the people have been spreading this around to the point that it gets back to, to the leaders of, of uh, Jerusalem. And watch what happens. They said, what do we? <laughs> but this man does many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away our, both our place and nation. Right? So this is the mindset that they have. They say, listen, these are our options. Right? Our options are we can kill him. Right? But the people believe in him. But we can kill him. Or if we don't kill him, what's going to happen is all this stuff that this man is doing, everybody is going to believe him. Everybody's going to believe him. And when they do, that's going to cause the Romans to come here and take our entire nation away from us. Remember, we have trauma. This is not like just a situation where you have the leaders of our people just being greedy. Right. They have a true concern. They have a true trauma. And this trauma goes back hundreds and hundreds of years because our people set in Jerusalem. Right. After our king Hezekiah. Remember Hezekiah. So Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. He was in a situation where the um, the king of Assyria had just completely wiped out the northern tribes. We saw that, hey, there's the northern tribes of Israel and then there's the southern tribes of Judah, right? We saw there was two different kings that we had of the Hebrews. All of a sudden, now the, the, the king of Assyria wipes out everybody in the north and he puts them in different nations, spreads them out over his territory. So we saw that happen. We see how easily our kingdom could be taken away from us. But the southern tribe, didn't. that didn't happen. They came against us a couple times. We got out of it. Hezekiah came against us. The most, I mean, uh, uh, the, the king of Assyria came against Hezekiah. The most high God battled for us. All the people laid out dead. And then uh, his own son, the king of Assyria, own son killed him. So we felt like, okay, we made it. Hezekiah then started getting gifts from all the different nations around because the king of Assyria was trying to get all of them. Right? He started getting gifts from all the nations around. How'd that make him feel? He's like, yeah, you know what? We, the, Yeah, I am the man. I am the man. You know what I mean? And then he showed Babylon all the stuff he got. Then you got fast forward. Babylon ended up uh, 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 taking some of our, our kings as captives. Right? Killing some of our kings. Replacing one king and telling them, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, nah, you going to rule. They start giving us order about who can be king in our land. And then eventually Babylon came and destroyed, just like the king of Assyria destroyed uh, the northern kingdom. They destroyed, destroyed Judah as well. The Babylon, the Babylonian king. Right. Nebuchadnezzar, he came in and he destroyed Judah as well. So now we're in this position where that's a real this is not it's not like it's something that we haven't seen happen. We know that this is a real possibility. We know that the prophecy that Yahuwah put on us is that if we don't obey his law, right, these are the things that will happen to us. So when the Pharisees are looking at this, it's a legitimate concern because they can just think about a hundred or so years ago. And guess what? The Greeks came in and they didn't wipe us out of our land. But the Greeks came in, they took over our temple and they sacrificed pigs and had false gods in our temple. 
in the temple of the Most High God that happened, and we were powerless to stop it. So that puts a in that's trauma on our people. Our people are looking at this like, man, we are too fragile. Like we're not strong enough right now to take on the Romans. We couldn't even take on the Greeks and the Romans got rid of the Greeks. So it's like now we're dealing with the most powerful empire that the world has ever seen. And you mean to tell us that this is who y'all want to make the king? This is who's supposed to take on the Roman empire? This guy who heal a couple sick people and do some, you know, little voodoo. We don't know what this man is doing. He's certainly not the warrior we're looking for. So the, the, the dilemma that they find themselves in is, sure, normally you wouldn't kill a man like this. You would just let things fizzle out. Right? Clearly, he's not truly the Messiah. Maybe he is a prophet of the Most High God. Right? But nevertheless, all the people think he's the Messiah and he's letting them think that. And clearly you're not the Messiah is how the, this is how the, the Pharisees are thinking about it. They looking like, man, listen, our dilemma is we can let this thing go on. Eventually, everybody going to think he's the Messiah because the thing just keeps spreading and getting bigger. And he keeps doing these miracles in front of different people. And if that happens, we're going to lose the entire nation. But on the other hand, watch this. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this, and this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yahshua should die for that nation. Right? So what he said, listen, y'all don't know what y'all talking about. Right? They going back and forth like, man, what should we do? I'm telling he doing a miracle. So, man, and look, if we keep letting it go there like this, Everybody going to think he the Messiah. Romans going to come and just take the whole thing when they see everybody calling this man king. How do you think Caesar going to take that? Right? That's how they kind of looking at it like, man, we know what happened to these nations that improperly call somebody a king. Caesar put King Herod over us. We can't be calling nobody else king. He going to come and get us. They got trauma. They looking at it. So then Caiaphas, who was the high priest, he said, man, y'all don't know what y'all are talking I like to imagine Kaiser came in there cocky and strong and calm. Look, y'all have no idea what y'all talking about. Let me tell you something. Don't you know that it's more expedient, right? It's more, it's more, it's more important, right? It's more appropriate, right? For one person to die than the whole nation. So he's saying. Look, I know y'all look at it as a dilemma. Like, I know normally we wouldn't kill this guy, right? Normally, normally this guy hasn't technically done anything, you know what I'm saying, that we can nail him on immediately. You know what I'm saying? It's like he done some borderline things, like maybe he blasphemed, maybe, you know what I'm saying? Normally, this might be an argument. Normally, we might debate this. We might take him to trial and just see how it turns out. He is like, but don't y'all know, more important than what happens normally, right, is that one person dies as opposed to the entire nation. Y'all concern is right. The Romans might come take it if we let this thing roll. So wouldn't it be better if one person dies on behalf of the entire nation, right? And everybody got to look at him like, because it's like, oh, well, actually, that's kind of wise. Watch what the book say. You there? Did we lose you? I don't think we lost Brother T. I think he is frozen. Yeah. Keep going, watch this. And for that nation, not that but together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. 
Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Yahshua therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called. Into a city called what? So here we can see that Yahushua, I think uh, Brother T having some connection issues. But here what we can see is we can see that 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 the Most High God has set it up so that they could take counsel against Yahushua. All of this is so that prophecy may be fulfilled, right? We don't have to get it, but in uh, Daniel chapter 9, we talked about it in our, in our Great Day study, right? Daniel chapter 9, it, it clearly tells us that the Messiah has to be cut off. Right. In Isaiah 53, the, the Messiah has to be cut off. In other words, the Messiah has to die. Right. And because of that, because the Messiah has to die, the the um, the chief priest or the, the high priest, he prophesied and not knowing in his, is his in his mind, he's not speaking prophecy in his mind. He just coming up with a good idea, but he don't really know that he's prophesying that the Messiah is going to end up dying. And the book say not just for our nation, but for also for the children of God scattered around, scattered abroad. Right. So that's the lost tribes of Israel. That's the, the Gentiles that, that find themselves righteous before the most high God. Right. That's everybody who the most high God is going to consider his child in the end, in the latter days. Right. This is setting it up. So now they're plotting at this point. It, it no longer is just a simple. OK. Let us catch you slipping. Let us catch you breaking the law. Now it becomes, no, 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 no. We need to catch him. We need to have something against him to justify killing him because they have to do this and they're going to have to kill him publicly. So that's when they started to plot. This is when the plot of his death begins, right? If you kind of think of it as a story arc at the point that we are, we are kind of like the climax, right? And then now it's about to be downhill from here until, until he dies. Right. It's the end of the movie. We are approaching the end of the movie at this point. Right. So. So. Um, Yahushua at this point, he starts to walk around a little bit more carefully. You know what I'm saying? He has to. Because at this point, they 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 actively trying to kill him. Before, it was just a couple randoms that was looking at him. He would say something. You know what I'm saying? He would say something slick. Then all of a sudden, they would pick up stones and be ready to kill him. You know what I'm saying? Now, at the top, they just made they made the deal. Like, look, God, this is enough. We got to do it. We got to do it. Call your people. You call your people. Everybody get somebody together. It's when we catch this guy, when we find him, make sure we gaffle him up and we're going to put it into this thing. Right. In other words, it's a wanted poster out for Yahushua at this point. It's not just rumors. It's not just people talking. It's not a disagreement or argument. No, at the top levels, they want him dead now. Right. So. Uh, next week, what we'll do is we'll go um, we'll go into uh, probably go into Luke 18. And um, yeah, we'll talk through a little matter of fact, let's 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 see. We got enough time. Let's go ahead and go to go ahead, give me Luke chapter 18, verse one. This is Luke chapter 18, verse one. And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was a there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded him, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this woman troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Right? So he's saying. When it says fear is not God nor regard man, it's saying that nothing moves this guy. Like it, he don't care about what's righteous and what's not. And he also don't care about anybody that can influence him. He ain't empathetic to nobody's situation. He just doing what whatever he think is right in his own eyes. Right. So he don't fear God, nor is he moved by man. However, he's saying that it was a woman that just constantly came to him day and night, day and night. Day and night. And watch what happens. Say, read it again, that last verse. Yeah, because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Right? So he's saying, just out of the simple fact that you are annoying me, 
You know what I'm saying? Like, you just keep coming, asking me the same thing and asking me to hear your case. It is annoying and I'm tired of dealing with it. So just based off of that alone, I'm going to avenge you. I'm going to make sure that you get your justice. Because goodness gracious, leave my butt alone, right? And now y'all sure told that parable, but watch, watch his explanation. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he not find shall he find faith on the earth? Right? So what he's saying is, Yahushua, and notice he said his elect, right? So the so those that will die in righteousness, right? Those that have the destiny to die in righteousness, he's saying, Don't you know? That the most high God, even if it even, even if the if the judge who's bothered, who don't care nothing about the most high God, who's just annoyed by this woman, ends up moving in her favor. Don't y'all know that if y'all are consistent and faithful in your prayer, that the most high God will quickly avenge you? Right? So his message here is we can't just like pray and then give up. Like I'm gonna pray for this once and then give up. I'm gonna ask God for this once and then give up. He's saying that your faith has to be such that you constantly and consistently ask God for the same thing over and over and over and over again with the belief that he'll do it for you, right? And that you are lining up because you have to be the elect, right? So that means that your soul has to line up with the book. Your heart has to line up with the book. You have to believe on him from the heart. In other words, your heart, which produces your behavior, has to generate behavior, right? That is consistent with what we have to repent from and consistent with the fruits of the spirit. Right. Once that happens, then you can pray to the most high God and you can expect things from him. But you can't just pray one time. And be like, OK, no, nah, most high God said, go ahead and bother me a little bit. Right. Keep going. Watch this. All this stuff is about faith. Right. Keep going. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Right. So the Most High God gave a picture of two. Right. And y'all should explain this parable. He said, listen, there's one that said, hey, look, I'm thankful that I'm not like one of these public or sinners. You know what I'm saying? And that I fast and I pay tithes and I do all these great things. Right. And he said, then there was another man. He don't even want to look up. He feels so ashamed. But he's a publican. Right. He's a publican. So another remember, publican, think of uh, think of a publican as somebody who's a traitor. Right. They work for the Romans. They come around like our people is like we're not used to having to like pay taxes to these different groups. We used to be in an independent nation. That's we the only nation that the most high God set up. So in our mind, like we despise the fact that we got to pay taxes to the Romans. So how you think it look when you got a Hebrew child? of Israel, right? That's coming around saying, hey, it's time to pay taxes to the Romans. Like, you working for them? Ugh. Right? Disgusting. So now, this publican is so ashamed that he don't even want to look up to the Most High God. He said, man, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner before the Most High God. Right? And the Most High God said, because of that confession, right, he is more justified than the other. Because the other is only talking about his righteousness. He's not acknowledging the sin. So what will happen is the most high God is going to say, okay, because you exalted yourself, I'm going to tear your butt down because I'm going to show you all the sin that you're missing. Why you saying, oh, I think I am not a sinner like them. I'm going to show you all the sin that you're missing that you ain't talking about. Whereas this other man who confessed his sin, I'm going to show him how to be righteous. Right? That's how the most high God is. Everything is about humility with the most high God, right? We have to make sure that he has the honor and he has the glory. And that comes with perspective. Grab, uh, grab uh, Luke 17. Luke 17, give me verse 7. 
This is the perspe the, the perspective that the that uh, Yahushua teaches us to have. Watch this. This is Luke 17, verse 7. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. That's right. Good. So he's saying, look, if I got a butler, right, if I got a butler, what's the likelihood after he get done cleaning up my darn house that I'm going to go to him and be like, go sit down so I can make you a plate. Like, I hired you for a job. Your job is clean my house and make me food. Right. That's your job. What's the likelihood that when I come home to this butler that I'm paying to clean my house, that just because he done half his job, I'm going to say, I do the other half. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to serve you now. And I'm not being paid by the butler to do that. That don't make sense. So that's what Yahushua is saying. If you got somebody that you're paying to take care of all your affairs and he just got done plowing the field, you're not going to walk up and be like, hey, go ahead and sit down and eat. Let me make your plate for you real quick. You did some good work, so let me make your plate. Like, no, part of his job is to make your plate after he get done plowing. Right? Watch what he said. Keep going. Doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which were commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. Right? That has to be the perspective that we come with. You can't have a perspective that that the man had in the parable that, oh, well, I thank you, God, because I pay tithes and and because I am a righteous man and I, I, I do all these things. Da, da, da. That can't be your perspective. You talking like you doing God a favor. No, that's boy, that's what I commanded you to do. I'm not saying thank you to that. Y'all sure is trying to teach us that. Everything that we do is a benefit for us. Right? When we obey Yah, that's a benefit to us. That's not a benefit to Yah. If we don't obey, he's gonna switch us out and pick somebody else. He don't gain anything from it. That's why he calls us unprofitable servants. He's saying that we should view ourselves rather as unprofitable servants. Right? Because if we view ourselves that way, then we have the right perspective that really. Even what we do in service of God is really in service of us. Right? When y'all pop up on the scene, what is he offering us? Eternal life. Streets paved with gold. You know what I'm saying? A mansion. You know what I'm saying? With treasures in heaven. Right? He's offering us things. There's a reward for us. It ain't like he get a reward in the end. Right? So all of it is really a selfish game. That's why the book tell us we haven't got to it yet. That's why Paul is going to later tell us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because at the end of the day, this is a selfish, selfish walk. You have to make sure you're good with God by any means. And the way to do that is at the end of it, doing everything that he commanded you to do. And when you get done, look at yourself as an unprofitable servant. And that's how you will make sure that your prayer comes out like the prayer of the man that just said, man, I'm a sinner versus the man that sit here bragging to the most high God and restating the most high God, all of his righteousness. Because all, although you think that you bragging about all your righteousness to the most high God, are you exalting yourself to the most high God? Man, the most high God is not going, he's going he not going to take kindly to that. Because he's going to look at that and like say, so what? That what you're supposed to do. You should have did it sooner. Remember, that's the mindset of the most high God. I know the mindset of us with our kids is if our kids do a good job, guess what you're supposed to do? Very good. Good job. That's our mindset. That's how we do it. We want to encourage our kids. We want to build them up. And that's love for us. When we look at that, we be like, man, that's love. But that's why a lot of people don't understand God. Right? A lot of people don't understand God because that's not his mindset. You see what it, read it again. You see what his mindset was. Give me so verse, what is that, eight? 10. Give me verse 10. Watch this. So likewise ye, when you shall have done all... No, no, no. Food, Give me verse 8 then. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may suck, and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken. And after Look, I may eat and drink. Y'all's mindset is, after you got done plowing, boy, I'm hungry. Why are you taking so long? 
put your darn belt back on, change your clothes, wash your darn hands, and make me some darn food. And then watch what he say after that. Does he think that does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. He so said, does he say thank you? Look, y'all been look, y'all's he, he doing whatever he do. He come in. You've been plowing all day, taking care of his darn field. Pushing, 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 plowing it. Thinking sure everything good. That's a lot of work. You tired. You see he walk in the door. You looking like, okay. Maybe he'll give me a break today. Man, look at you like, man, what's taking you so long? Take them darn gloves off. Change your darn clothes. Wipe your darn feet. Don't get my darn floor dirty. And uh, make me something to eat. You got to change your clothes. You just got done in the field. You wipe the sweat off. Take a little quick little bath so you don't get the food dirty. You bring him some food. And the man don't even say thank you to you. If it happened to us right now with a human being, we would say you are ungrateful. I can't work for this person. Y'all have to understand the God that y'all serve. He's not going to say thank you. He's not looking at you like you did something for him. When you serve him, you did something for you. It's an honor. Boy, your butt, you don't have to have no field. You don't have to have nothing to eat. You don't have to have nowhere to sleep. You can go work some, for somebody or go find somebody else to work for. Because there's plenty of people that I put in this spot. That's how y'all look at you. It's not the same as we look at our children and we might look for somebody who worked for us. Because I tell you, look, the people, the, the, the people that I lead at work, I tell them thank you all the time. I appreciate you. My kids, I tell them thank you all the time. I appreciate you. Please, I tell my kids, please and thank you. Can you go get that for me, please? You can ask them. I, I, you're not, you not going to find too much of anything without me saying a please to my kids. But you ain't getting that from the most high God. You never getting a please out of the most high God. You never getting you never getting a thank you out of the most high God. Most you're gonna get is, well done. You know what I'm saying? Well done. You did a good job. And you only gonna get that at the very end. After you done busted your tail, the job gotta be finished. And then you'll get a well done. You don't just get a well done just because you did half the job because you plowed the field. We still gotta work. And when we get done doing everything, we gotta say. Still an unprofitable servant. If you have that mindset, then you built for this. If you don't have that mindset, get that mindset. If you don't want that mindset, that's your business. Go ahead and send in any questions you have. Let's go ahead and pray out.